ready to go. All right, we're getting a little bit behind in our timeline. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, David Fredericks. Uh, Dr. Fredericks is a faculty member here at Fred Hutch and also at the University of Washington. Uh, a member at the Hutch, full professor at the university, and uh, a member of the, uh, what's called the BIDD Vaccine uh, Infectious Disease Division here at the Hutch, Infectious Disease Division at the university, and uh, a long-term expert in studying the uh, human microbiome. And as we touched on uh, earlier, uh, that's becoming a really hot area in terms of research and the possible implications and overlap with immunotherapy drugs being applied to cancer. So. Uh, very excited to hear what um, Dr. Fredericks has to say for us this morning. Thank right. you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about our fellow travelers and the human microbiome today with you. Uh, so first of all, what exactly is the microbiome? Uh, the microbiome is the collection of microbes and their associated genes that exist on and in the human body, forming, in essence, a second genome extending the genetic and functional capabilities of human beings. Humans are really super organisms. They are a conglomeration of human and microbial genes. Uh, there are about as many microbial cells in your body as there are human cells. So you may think you're sitting alone in that chair, but you're actually sitting with 39 trillion microbes. Um, there are about 19,000 genes in the human body. There are more than 3 million microbial genes in the human body. And those genes code for properties that we don't need to code for. For instance, uh, in your gut, uh, there are numerous enzymes that your bacteria make that help you to digest your food. Without those, we would lose many of those nutrients. Many of the microbes that exist in the human body remain uncultivated uh, and are uh, new to science. The other key point is that uh, there's a different human-associated microbial community at every body site. So the gut microbiota is different than the microbiota that you find in the mouth, which is different than the microbiota that you find in the skin, which is different from the microbiota that you find in the genital tract. One of the areas that I study is the human vagina, and the vagina is unique in that it's one of the most acidic places in the human body outside of the stomach. It has a pH of around 3.5 to 4, um, and that leads to a different microbial community in the vagina, for instance, than what you have in the gut, where it's dominated by lactobacillus species, which in part produce acid that helps to drive down the pH and make it inhospitable for the other microorganisms to exist in that niche. So human beings have different microbial communities at each body site, but even within a given body site, different human beings are different. So this is data from the American Gut Project where people sent in stool samples and had the microbial community profiles characterized using broad range 16S ribosomal RNA gene PCR with high throughput sequencing as a way of looking at the barcodes of the bacteria that are present, for instance, in stool. And what we find is that there are some subjects uh, where we see that there's high abundance of this Firmicutes phylum, which are a class of bacteria present in the gut. There's others that have low abundance of their Firmicutes in red, others with high abundance of the Bacteroidetes, and low, others with uh, low abundance of the Bacteroidetes. So different people have different abundances of these different bacteria uh, in the same body site. And this is the same when you look at multiple body sites across humans. This has led to the notion that each individual may have their own personalized microbiome, which is a fascinating concept, because that, that also means these differences in microbial communities may affect your health or your propensity to develop disease. Uh, this is just uh, some data from uh, uh, eight uh, subjects here at the Fred Hush Cancer Research Center where we looked at their stool samples and characterized their gut microbial communities. Again, these are the different phyla of bacteria that are present in these eight subjects. And again, what you can see across individuals is that um, each bar here represents a different species of bacteria uh, that's present in their stool sample. Um, uh, each, each bar represents a different bacterium that's present in the stool sample of that subject. Uh, 
Um, and so, for instance, this subject, uh, for instance, you have these blue uh, bars, a, a characteristic of Lactosporaceae, whereas in this subject here, it's missing that class of uh, bacteria. Um, so again, different subjects have different types of microbial communities present. What are these microbes doing in the gut? Well, these microbes are taking things like fiber that's present in our diet and converting it to short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate. And that butyrate uh, is absorbed into the portal circulation, goes to the liver where it's converted into fats and sugars, which we use for energy. So in part, these microbes are releasing enzymes that help to break down uh, uh, fiber and other dietary elements uh, into things that we can absorb and metabolize. This is a schematic showing uh, uh, what some of these bacteria are doing. And for instance, one bacterium, uh, Fecalibacterium prusnitzii, uh, is a bacterium that digests the fiber in our diet and converts it to butyrate. Butyrate is a short-chain fatty acid that's used by the intestinal epithelial cells as a primary energy source. Uh, uh, and it's essential for the function of those epithelial cells and helps to repair epithelial cells when they're injured, for instance, after colitis. Um, that butyrate not only helps to uh, uh, support the function of these intestinal epithelial cells, but it diffuses into the deep mucosa of the intestine where it interacts with immune cells, such as T regulatory cells. And this butyrate helps to promote an anti-inflammatory environment by promoting the replication and function of T regulatory cells. So these bacteria are producing a compound which is affecting the immune system of the host and inflammation. If you're not consuming a high fiber diet um, and you're missing some of these bacteria, such as Fecalae bacterium prusnitzii, what happens is the bacteria begin to eat the mucus layer that surrounds the intestine. Uh, they then degrade that layer and then begin invading into the intestinal mucosa where they uh, stimulate toll-like receptors and other immune uh, receptors that cause inflammation. And the absence of this short-chain fatty acid, butyrate, leads to a loss of the down-regulating immune response from the T regulatory cells, again, promoting an inflammatory response. So this is why your mother has told you to eat your fruits and vegetables, uh, to have some of that fiber in your diet that helps to feed the microbiota that's in your gut that provides this health benefit uh, to you. Now what happens when instead of eating your high fiber diet, you eat a diet that's high in meat and milk products? Well, it turns out that the microbes in your gut uh, can also produce compounds that are noxious for your health. And for instance, some microbes that exist in your colon will take the carnitine in red meat or the choline in milk and cheese and convert it into a compound called uh, trimethylamine. The trimethylamine is absorbed into your bloodstream. It goes to the liver where it's converted into another chemical called trimethylamine oxide. It turns out that trimethylamine oxide inhibits reverse cholesterol transport, uh, causes aggregation of platelets, and leads to an increase in cardiovascular disease, including heart attacks, stroke, atherosclerosis. Interestingly, uh, trimethylamine also has effects on the kidney, where it can lead to fibrosis and injury to the kidney. And when people have chronic kidney disease with renal insufficiency, that in turn leads to higher levels of trimethylamine oxide, which then further aggravate uh, this risk towards cardiovascular disease. So again, showing how microbes not only help promote health, but also can contribute to diseases such as cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. And in fact, there's a lot of interest in trying to inhibit some of these enzymes in microbes that produce trimethylamine oxide as a way of uh, reducing risk of cardiovascular disease. So why study the microbiome? There are many compelling reasons. The first is to identify microbes that are associated with health. For instance, how do microbes contribute to normal human physiology, immunity, and develop? Second, to identify microbes associated with disease. For instance, how do changes in the human microbiota contribute either directly or indirectly to disease 
or increase risk for disease such as cancer. Um, we normally think about pathogens as being a specific microbe like Mycobacterium tuberculosis that's associated with TB. But we need to move beyond that simplistic concept and consider the possibility that disease may be produced by microbial communities, not just by individual microbes, working in concert, for instance, to produce a pathological state. And this leads to the notion of a dysbiosis or an alteration in microbial communities associated with disease. The other reason to study the human microbiota is that it's changeable. And we can change the microbiota by giving probiotics, which are live microbes administered to humans in order to change the colonization state. Prebiotics, which are nutrients used to promote the growth of specific microbes within the human body. Symbiotics, which are a combination of prebiotics and probiotics, where the uh, probiotic uses the prebiotic in order to grow. We can use antibiotics to manipulate the microbiota and eliminate pathogens. And then we can even use fecal microbiota transplants, where we take stool from a healthy person and give it to somebody who's unhealthy to try and restore the normal diversity that's present in the colon. Um, so how does the gut microbiota impact our health? We depend on our gut microbes to produce vitamin K. This is an essential nutrient that's essential for normal blood clotting. We don't make it. Our gut microbes do. Uh, the microbiota is essential for the normal development of both innate and adaptive immunity in the human body. Uh, mice that are raised under germ-free conditions have completely abnormal immune systems. The Microbiota, microbiota plays a critical role in both in the function of gut epithelial cells, such as by producing butyrate, and even the microbiota plays a role in the metabolism of drugs uh, that we take into our body. It is possible to raise mice under germ-free conditions, where they're born by cesarean section, then raised in isolator cages where all of the food and water that goes into those cages is irradiated and free of microbes. And when mice are raised under those conditions, what we find is that they require 30% more nutrients in order to maintain a normal body weight compared to mice raised under normal conditions. And what this shows is that the gut microbiota is actually essential for extracting uh, nutrients uh, from our body. Um, the microbiota plays a critical role in organ size development and intestine. These mice raised under germ-free conditions have massive hypertrophy of the intestines and is quite abnormal. Again, showing that the microbes are playing a key role in maintaining a healthy environment. And even mice uh, that are raised under germ-free conditions have abnormal behavior, where they engage in more searching and locomotor activity uh, when raised germ-free. So uh, this is a slide. Uh, that shows the microbiota of one subject over time. Uh, and on the x-axis is days after hematopoietic cell transplantation. And on the y-axis, we see the uh, relative abundance of different bacterial species uh, shown here in this legend on the right. And what this graph is meant to display is how dynamic the gut microbiota can be in response to antibiotics. So this is a patient who came to transplant with a very abnormal microbiota because he had Clostridium difficile colitis and had a microbiota dominated by streptococcal species, uh, and then was put on levofloxacin, which is an antibiotic that we give to some of our cancer patients who are neutropenic in order to prevent them from developing infections. Um, and uh, under the pressure of this antibiotic, we see a bloom in enterococcal species in this subject under that antibiotic pressure. And then look what happens at this time point right here when the levofloxacin was stopped. We see this bloom, this explosion of these bacteria in yellow here, and again, an explosion, a radiation of these bacteria in blue of the lactosporaceae, showing that when you remove that antibiotic selection pressure, you get an expansion of all these different classes of bacteria uh, present in the gut. Um, and then also, interestingly, an ex uh, increase in some gram-negative rods that were uh, present in the subject. And then he was put back on levofloxacin, where we see a collapse and a disappearance of these gram-negative rods. He was later put on ernapenem, where another antibiotic, where again we see a collapse and loss of numerous bacterial species. So it just goes to show you 
the impact that antibiotics can have on our gut microbiota, which is important when we uh, talk about that in just a moment. So what's the connection between microbes and cancer? Well, some microbes may protect against cancer, such as by metabolizing genotoxic agents, which may cause DNA damage. Some microbes play a direct role in inducing cancer. Microbes such as Helicobacter pylori, an organism that lives in the stomach of certain individuals and is associated with gastric cancer in those individuals. Or human papillomavirus, a, a virus that's associated with uh, cervical cancer. Some microbes may facilitate the treatment of cancer by enhancing the host immune response, and we'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. Now, this is a study just from this week, uh, which I pulled uh, from July 5th, uh, looking at combination immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy for the treatment of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, and what's interesting about this study and some of the studies that Scott has mentioned uh, previously is that these immune checkpoint inhibitors show a distinct role in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. But in the study, about 40% of people responded to the immune checkpoint inhibitors, and a larger percentage of people didn't respond to these immune checkpoint inhibitors, which begs the question, why? What is different about those individuals, for instance, that aren't responding to the immune checkpoint inhibitors? Well, um, uh, this is another kind of uh, cartoon slide uh, to augment what Scott showed you. And essentially, these T cells have this uh, PD-1 receptor. Um, and when bound to the uh, PD-L1 receptor, it acts as a break to reduce its inflammatory potential. And so even though the T cell may bind to an antigen on a tumor cell that would allow it to kill that tumor cell, the breaks are on. Uh, and it can't actually kill that tumor cell unless you block this PD-1, which then releases this break. And, and uh, uh, some of these immune checkpoint inhibitors really work in this way by releasing this break and allowing the T cell to then kill off the tumor cell. Now, why should you care about the microbiota in somebody who has kidney cancer? Well, there were some fascinating studies that recently were published in the journal Science that linked the microbiota to response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what they showed uh, in several animal models is that if you take mice and you give them melanoma and then give them an immune checkpoint inhibitor, it works fine as long as you've got an intact microbiota. But if they have a disturbed microbiota, the immune checkpoint inhibitors no longer work. And in fact, if you take these mice and you raise them under germ-free conditions, the immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work. But if you give back specific bacteria to these mice, you now reactivate the ability of these immune checkpoint inhibitors to have an anti-tumor response against the melanoma. And for instance, in this study published here, what they showed was that bifidobacterium species, a bacterium that's present in the gut of humans and very common in the gut of children, is associated with having an active immune response uh, when given the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And in this study, another study, again, here looking at the PD-1 inhibitor, this is a, a different immune checkpoint inhibitor, the CTLA-4 molecule, which works in a similar way to the um, uh, PD-1 uh, uh, connection of proteins, that again, having this bacterium Bacteroides fragilis in the gut of these mice protects them um, and allows them to have an anti-tumor response. Uh, is that at all relevant to renal cell carcinoma? Well, uh, there was an abstract that was recently presented at a genital urinary cancer meeting highlighting that those patients with uh, renal cell carcinoma who had had previous antibiotic therapy had a reduction in progression-free survival compared to those who hadn't received antibiotics, suggesting that the gut microbiota may be impacting the response to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and here in this particular study, the survival in those that re had received antibiotics was 2.3 months, where it was eight months in those that hadn't received antibiotics. What this study didn't show was whether there were specific bacteria that were associated with this response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Question in the back. That hasn't been, yeah, that hasn't been determined. 
And, and furthermore, um, you know, there's also a potential for confounding here, which is it's possible that those patients that got antibiotics were sicker than those patients that hadn't, didn't receive antibiotics. Uh, but we need to do more studies looking at whether there are specific antibiotics, whether there are specific changes in the microbiota that predict your response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, there are other examples where microbes uh, can play a role uh, in uh, cancer therapy. Uh, and one example is with bladder cancer. And for decades, we've used essentially a bacterial immunotherapy for the treatment of bladder cancer. Uh, and here, what physicians do is they instill a mycobacterium, Bacille calmette garon which is a relative of tuberculosis, into the bladder of uh, people with resected bladder cancer. And what happens is that those tumor cells take up the mycobacteria in green into those cells. And in fact, the same mutations that allow the cell to turn into a cancer cell also promote the uptake of these mycobacteria within the cell. These mycobacteria cause direct damage to the cell, killing them, but also help to recruit in immune cells that participate in controlling the bladder cancer that's present in the wall of that bladder. So this is an early example of immune therapy using microbes to enhance the immune response. Um, so how can we manipulate the microbiota of humans? Well, we can give probiotics, uh, things like lactobacillus uh, and even bifidobacteria. The problem with a lot of these probiotic formulations is that they were formulated because the bacteria grow well in milk. And they're not necessarily the bacteria that are healthy for your intestine. On the other hand, bifidobacteria are common members of probiotic formulations. And given its connection with uh, 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 enhanced uh, immune checkpoint uh, response in mice, it's possible that, for instance, bifidobacteria probiotics could play a role in uh, 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 enhancing immune checkpoint inhibitor response in humans. Those studies haven't been done yet. Uh, there's bacterial therapy, uh, or also known as fecal microbiota transplantation. We are doing this to patients with Clostridium difficile colitis. Um, here at the center and at the University of Washington and many places across the United States. People with Clostridium difficile colitis have an absence of healthy bacteria in their gut, and this is one way of reconstituting a healthy microbiota, where uh, we have a healthy donor, we collect stool from that donor, make sure they're not, they don't have any uh, infections like HIV, hepatitis, et cetera, and after screening that donor and their stool, uh, we then uh, take that stool and inject it uh, via colonoscope uh, into the colon of that patient. And it's actually more effective than antibiotic therapy for the treatment of Clostridium difficile and helps to restore bacterial diversity. It's possible in the future that if we know that there's a certain microbial community profile associated with response to your anti-tumor therapy, we could manipulate the microbiota in this way using fecal microbiota transplantation. Another more appealing way of uh, altering the <laughs> microbiota um, is to use engineered microbial communities. Um, and there are numerous uh, uh, companies uh, that are uh, creating freeze-dried capsules uh, containing microbes from the human gut, which they've grown up to high concentration, have created spores for these bacteria. You ingest the capsule, the capsule dissolves, it goes into your colon, and releases those spores where those bacteria can replicate. That's another appealing way of altering the microbiota of humans in order to enhance uh, health of the subjects. Um, so my take-home message is, is that humans are colonized with trillions of microbial cells that help to aid digestion, stimulate immune responses, and shape our chemical environment. Some cancers are caused by microbes, such as Helicobacter pylori and stomach cancer. There have been very few studies that have examined this in patients with renal cell carcinoma, although there's at least one epidemiological study that's demonstrated that patients with a history of urinary tract infection have about a two-fold increased risk of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, there are differences in microbial communities across humans which may influence risk of disease and response to treatment, such as with renal cell carcinoma. And microbe-induced inflammation has been harnessed to treat bladder cancer, and there may be opportunities to harness this in the future 
for treating other cancers. I'll end there and open it up to any questions you have. Yes? You had mentioned that different patients have hugely different amounts of microbial Correct. Cross yes. Is there a norm like there is for blood tests, uh, or is it that we treat them uh, as long as the, uh, the body colon is in good shape, the body finds its own normal? Yeah, and that's what's so interesting is that there are different states of normal. You know, there isn't one size fits all. What we do know is that normal is associated with diversity, which is that we find lots of different bacterial species. And typically, you have about 100 or 200 different bacterial species present in the gut. It's abnormal just to have one, OK? Um, but what happens, um, you may ask, well, how do you acquire your microbiota? And the fact of the matter is that you acquire that in infancy. And the first two years of life are incredibly dynamic, with bacterial species moving in and then leaving, and then other species moving in and leaving. But after about two to three years of life, it begins to stabilize towards a more adult-like microbiota with lots of diversity and stability of the microbiota. Um, so um, we know that um, normal means that there's different people with different types of microbial communities. We still need to understand, though, whether some of what we call normal is associated with health, and whether there are certain things that are more healthy than other types of what we now call normal. Question. So how new is the understanding of, of these microbes and their interaction? Has it been something that's just being studied the last 10, 20 years? Is it, you know, how, how new is the um, understanding? So, um, it's pretty new, um, and a lot of this has been driven in the last uh, 20 years by advances in sequencing technology. Many of these microbes that exist, for instance, in the human colon haven't been propagated in the laboratory. They're difficult to grow, and so if you can't grow them, how do you study them? But there's a way of studying them without growing them, which is to look at their DNA. And so what we do is instead of trying to grow them in a petri dish in the laboratory, what we do is we take that stool sample, we break open all of the cells, and we sequence through the DNA that's there as a way of identifying all the microbes that are present in that community. And that high throughput sequencing technology has only been available for the last about 10 years, uh, which has allowed us to really characterize the full diversity of microbes that are present. And that's led to an explosion in the field and this interest in microbiome science. And we're, so we're really still beginning to understand who's there, but more importantly, how they're interacting with each other, the other microbes, and with the human host to either promote health or lead to disease. Question, White. Uh, should we start taking like, uh, you know, fermented tea and activa and all of that stuff to help our immune response? Yeah. And so, um, uh, first of all, um, there's no evidence that that stuff harms you, <laughs> OK? Unlike some other things that we could give you. Um, um, and so it's fine to take Activia or kombucha or kefir uh, or sauerkraut or other things uh, that contain uh, microbes. Um, and in fact, we did a study here at the Fred Hart Cancer Research Center where we looked at patients who developed bacteremia uh, with some of the bacteria that we typically think of as probiotic type of bacteria, like lactobacillus. And what we find is even in our cancer patients who are immunocompromised, and they develop bacteremia with these organisms, they never die of it, uh, which is just goes to the point that these are non-pathogenic, low path pathogenicity organisms. Um, and so I would say it's fine to uh, take some of these probiotics. Now, the, the bigger question, though, is does it provide a benefit? And that's harder to prove. Uh, that is providing some distinct health benefit. Um, uh, and what's inter other, the other point that's interesting is that in studies where we've given probiotics to people, where they get billions and billions of cells of some microbe every day, it doesn't actually displace your normal microbiota. Yeah, it's disappointing. You would think that by giving two trillion cells of a specific microbe every day, like lactobacillus rhamnosus, which is a probiotic, you would completely change the microbiota. It doesn't. It does change what those microbes are doing. It changes their gene expression profile when you take those. And it may change how the uh, human host is interacting with those microbes. 
uh, but it's not like you're completely re-engineering your microbiota by taking a probiotic, which is also why I think that it's relatively uh, safe to take. Um, and and for some, for, there, there is some evidence that probiotics can help. So for instance, um, in um, uh, patients who are uh, receiving antibiotics, um, it tends to prevent them from developing C. diff. It doesn't really help that well if they've already developed C. diff, but for patients who don't have C. diff and are at risk for C. diff, there's some benefit to taking probiotics, uh, for instance. Um, Clostridium difficile, it's a, it produces colitis, so it's an antibiotic-associated diarrhea where you get an overgrowth of one bacterium that's in your gastrointestinal tract, and it produces a toxin that causes damage to the gut and diarrhea. And we treat that with antibiotics, but all of those antibiotics then lead to a collapse in diversity, which then paradoxically increases your risk of recurrence of the Clostridium difficile, <laughs> which is why some of the new treatments are, instead of giving more antibiotics, you give bacteria therapy to restore the normal bacterial diversity. And it turns out by restoring diversity, those other microbes produce compounds that inhibit the growth of the Clostridium difficile. So again, suggesting this holistic approach to, uh, to treatment. So bottom line is, I don't think the probiotics are gonna hurt you. We need to collect more evidence of how they're helping. Should we switch to?